I'm going to be talking about caching for cash. That's what we're all after. This is an enormous screen. OK, I'm going to have to stand here so I can see. Um, so I'm going to teach or talk about more than you want to know about caching or need to know. Um, and before I start that, I just want to say that uh, epicweb.dev is this big thing that I'm working on. And I just finished the 452nd video uh, yesterday. This is an enormous project that I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about full stack web development. And I cannot wait for this to get launched in the next couple of weeks. So keep an eye out for Epic Web Dev if you've never been there before. Um, actually, how many of you have gone through testingjavascript.com or Epic React Dev? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, this is going to be way better. OK, so we're actually, I, I'm kind of strapped for time. So we're going to skip the uh, air squats that I normally do before my talks. Um, so get some exercise. Um, get that blood flowing. This talk is a deep dive on caching fundamentals, and there's going to be some code examples. It is not comprehensive. Uh, sorry about that, mouse. Um, so yeah, we've just got a lot to discuss. So let's get started. There are two ways to make your code faster. You can either delete it or reduce the amount of stuff the code is doing. I've got a problem with deleting it, though. I kind of like to make money, and my job is to write code. And if we're deleting all the code, then I don't get any money. So that's not going to And this is supposed to be caching for cash, right? So we can't do that. Um, reducing the stuff that your code is doing is uh, also problematic, because like, you just pointed to all of me. <laughs> like, our, our job is to do stuff. Um, but I want to call out both of these mechanisms for making your code faster, because um, caching is non-trivial and can incre increase the complexity of your application quite a bit. And uh, so you need to consider ways that you can um, speed up your code that do don't involve caching. Uh, so I have this blog post, Don't Solve Problems, Eliminate Them, that you can go read. I actually have a talk associated to this as well, um, where it talks about how we can just adjust the, um, the way that we're approaching a problem and drastically reduce the number of problems that we um, encounter with doing that. Um, so there could be a, a different way to do what you're trying to do that wouldn't involve caching in the first place. Um, I also have another blog post titled, Fix the Slow Render Before You Fix the Re-Render. How many of you all are worried about like renders? Like, let me rephrase that. Um, how many of you work with React or Vue or Svelte or one of those? Okay, so if you're working with Svelte, apparently you don't care about re-renders because it's just wildly fast. If you're working with SolidJS, also do that doesn't matter apparently, I don't know. But for me, um, a in the React ecosystem, a lot of people are thinking about re-renders and how like bad that is for performance. Um, and, and React has the ability to reduce those re-renders through uh, React.memo, or back in the old days, we had Pure Component. Um, I have been working with React for years. I have never once in my life, since 2015, I've never once in my life had to ship to production one of those optimizations. So my solution to the re-render problem is not to reduce the number of renders I have, but just to make sure that my renders are fast. And so there are other ways that you can optimize React applications. Um, React.memo is caching. And so that's why I wanted to mention that before we start talking about caching. Um, there are certainly use cases for using React.memo and um, the pure component uh, ideas. But uh, yeah, I don't think that it's like the panacea that's going to solve all your problems. Um, make things fast. Because eventually, like, that component does have to render at some point. And so you want that to be a fast render. OK. So we cannot delete it, we can't reduce it, and we can't just make it fast. Maybe the thing we're trying to cache is uh, computing pi to a certain number of decimal points, or uh, I don't know, maybe you're talking to a third party endpoint. You don't get to choose how fast that endpoint is. Uh, and maybe it's not even about speed either. Maybe you're, uh, it costs money every time you make a request to this endpoint, and so you don't want to call it more than uh, you absolutely have to. So what you're going to do is you're going to cache it. But not that kind of cache, unfortunately. You're going to cache it with a CH. Some people pronounce that as cache. That is wrong. It is cache. Um, so let's talk about caching. What is caching? In computing, uh, no, just kidding. I'm, not, I'm totally not going to read that nonsense from Wikipedia. Thanks, anyway. Uh, so let's, we're going to look at an example. Uh, so here we're going to compute pi. How many of you have a function like this in your code base, where you compute pi? 
No? Not a single one of you is computing pi. Wow, this must be very contrived. Uh, so <laughs> this is how you compute pi uh, to, I think it's like 10 decimal places. Um, and here's what a cache is. So we have let pi, and then we uh, have this compute pi cached. And if pi is undefined, then we're going to call compute pi and assign it to pi and then return pi. And then the next time this is called, we don't have to call compute pi again. And we just return pi because now pi has been defined. That's what a cache is. There you go. I've just taught you caching. Ta-da. So caching is uh, you store the result of a computation somewhere and return that stored value instead of recomputing it again. That's the entire principle of caching. Sadly, it is way more complicated than that. But this is the core principle of caching that we have to uh, consider. Let's make it a little bit more complicated. Now, you can specify a precision. So how, how many decimal places you want pi to go out to. And so this is going to increase complexity, because if we were doing the same thing as before, you would call it with a precision of 2, and then call it with a precision of 3, and you would get the previous answer. So we have to change the way that we're uh, doing this caching. And the way that we do that is with uh, a map. Or you could use an object or, or uh, just some, some mechanism, some place that you're going to store all of the return values of pi. And so if uh, the pi cache has that precision value, then uh, we're not going to bother ca computing pi. If it doesn't, then we will. And we'll set that precision into the cache, and then we always return that. So this is the exact same thing, except now we can store multiple uh, return values for computing pi. So that's nice, um, but it introduces a, uh, a really important principle in caching, and that is cache keys. Um, and this is the thing that makes caching a little bit complicated. So let's look at another example, maybe a tiny bit more uh, realistic, but still, I don't think I have a sum function in my application either. Um, but uh, here is the interesting thing about cache keys, is that they have to en uh, encapsulate or represent all of the inputs for your cache value. Uh, otherwise, you could end up returning the, uh, the wrong value uh, as being uh, cached. So we have our key is A and B with a uh, comma between them. And um, the, then the rest of this is what we've seen before. So let's look at an, uh, or step through this example. So we dive in, we create the key. It's 1, 2. And then the sum cache is empty right now. So there's nothing in there. So we're going to uh, dive in and uh, call the sum function and set that in the cache. And now our sum cache has 1, 2. And that uh, value is 3. And so then the next time we're going to dive in, and we say, OK, now I've got that 1, 2 again. It all, the sum cache still has that cache key. And so we, have, we can skip over that if statement consequent, and we still get the proper return value of 3. So that is caching with a cache key. And um, we have what we call a cache miss for that first call and a cache hit for the second call. So um, let's talk about the problem with keys. So I want you to find the bug. We're going to play a game. Find the bug in this code. What is the problem here? Feel free to shout it out when you know the answer. You can't cache the current date. Oh my gosh. The, the uh, bug right here is the key. The key is not including all of the dependencies or the inputs for our, um, our utility here. So the, let's say we uh, add ca uh, days cache 3. We're going to get three days from today. We call it again, and that's a cache hit. We'll get three days from today again. And then we wait 24 hours. We call it again with 3, and now we get three days from yesterday, which is two days from today. So it's going to be the wrong value. So yes, the problem is that uh, date.now, which I should have an arrow pointing to it, and you can't see my uh, pointer, but um, on line 3, we have a date.now. That is an input into our uh, add days function. We need to represent that in the cache key somehow, but that wouldn't make any sense, um, because then you, you wouldn't ever get a cache hit, because your date.now is always going to be different. So uh, there you go. Sorry, Homer, but we've got to do this. The bug that you thought was just a small bug was many small bugs. <laughs> So here's the thing with cache keys. The cache key must, asterisk, account for all inputs required to determine the result. And uh, otherwise, you're going to end up with stale values. So the asterisk is actually to say, um, the, uh, illustrate a couple of problems with cache keys and, and with this rule about cache keys. So first of all, it's easy to miss an input. 
Sometimes you have too many inputs, and computing correct cache keys is costly. That was intentional alliteration. So let's talk about each one of these. It's easy to miss an input. Uh, raise your hand again if you uh, are working in React on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, how many of you love use effect dependency arrays? Or use memo? We got a couple. Use memo, use callback. All these require dependency arrays. Uh, and how many of you, no shame, have uh, missed an item in the dependency array? Yeah. It's hard to keep track of those things. We have an entire lint plugin to make sure that you don't miss anything. That, to me, communicates that this is a, a challenging problem. And uh, so use memo is uh, a cache. Uh, and uh, so is use callback. And, and uh, react.memo, also a cache. And uh, it is difficult to keep track of all the dependencies that you have. And in, in particular, um, well, React has a whole bunch of other interesting things you we could talk about. But that's not what this talk is about. So we're going to sk skip all that. Uh, another problem is too many inputs. So this is the Google Flights UI. And uh, look at the number of inputs to determine those flights. Now, I'll bet you just about anything that, that Google is caching a lot of stuff for this page. But I'll bet you that same amount of anything, or at least whatever's, whatever monetary money is in my wallet, which is nothing, that uh, they are not caching the results of all of these filters. Right, this would just be the permutations of this would mean they basically never get a cache hit. They probably also include your own user profile information as well. So, like every single user would get their own cache for their own combination of filters. That would be ridiculous. So, of course, you're not going to cache that. You probably cache stuff underneath because they're ha probably talking to these uh, APIs for all of these uh, flight um, or airlines. Uh, so, they're probably caching some of that stuff to make this really fast. But they're certainly not caching everything. Uh, and so sometimes you just cannot cache all of uh, the possible inputs. And then finally, computing correct cache keys is costly. So this is my uh, website. And uh, on my website, uh, the blog posts are actually uh, uh, compiled at runtime. And so I don't have like a build step and then deploy my built artifacts. I actually have a runtime that will uh, compile all of the blog posts um, into HTML. So I start with MDX and then compile it into HTML. Um, and then also, I at runtime will go to GitHub, which is my CMS that I made, <laughs> um, and it will uh, download the contents of uh, that MDX before compiling it. So the interesting thing here is that it takes like 200 milliseconds to download from GitHub, and uh, then it takes another 500 milliseconds to compile. And if you go to my website right now, you're getting my blog posts in 100 milliseconds or less. So how do I do this? I do this because I cache it. Uh, and the, the challenging piece of this, though, is that um, the cached version or, or, or the output, the ultimate output is the HTML, but the input is the MDX. And so my cache key for that HTML is going to be my MDX, right? That's the, uh, or at least maybe a hash of that, um, of that MDX. And so uh, to be able to compute the cache key, I have to first download that uh, MDX from GitHub, which is very costly. It takes 200 milliseconds to be able to download that to calculate the cache key. So sometimes computing the cache key is costly. And we, we've got this problem as well. So how do we deal with this problem of, uh, of cache keys? We cheat with cache revalidation. We embrace the fact that we are going to give stale values sometimes. And so um, here are a couple of the approaches that we take to reduce the impact, the negative impact of that. So uh, you can proactively update the cache. And this is what I do on my blog. Uh, so on a post update. Uh, you update the cache. So I have a GitHub action that anytime I push a content update to my website, it will tell uh, my server, hey, there was an update to this content. My server will go and download. Uh, it will still like, continue serving cached uh, values to users, but it will go and download the um, MDX from GitHub and then recompile the blog and update the cache that way. And so uh, for like about 10 seconds, users are seeing a, a stale version of my blog post. That's reasonable enough for me. And so um, yeah, we are, we are cheating because I don't include everything as part of the cache key for that. The cache key for my blog post is just the slug. 
Uh, okay, and then timed in invalidation, that's uh, cache control headers is a good example of this. Uh, so the server can tell the browser, hey, here's how long I want you to cache this resource. Don't even ask me about it again in the future, uh, like 60 seconds, because it's not gonna change, or even if it does change, I don't want you talking to me because it's expensive for me to do this or whatever. And so um, that we're just embracing the fact that we could potentially have some stale values over the, uh, the course of that time, and that, it, that is fine. Um, but we can do even better than this, uh, and that is with stale while revalidate. So I'm going to kind of talk about um, a, a couple of or, or uh, what a content delivery network is and how all of that works. So watch me carefully. Here I'm standing, when I'm standing over here, I'm the browser, and then I'm the content delivery network, and then I'm the server. So that um, over here with the browser, the browser says, hey, I want to get this resource. Let's say it's an MP3, or uh, let's, yeah, let's just do an HTML page. Okay, so a blog post. So browser says, hey, I want to go get this resource. It's going to go through the CDN to get that. The CDN's going to say, oh, I don't know about that resource, so I'm going to go over to the server. The server's like, oh, great, let me build that HTML page for you, and I'll send that over to the, the CDN with that uh, cache control header, and the server or the CDN will say, oh, great, you want me to cache this for 60 seconds. I will do that. So the CDN will actually hang on to that, and then it'll go over to the browser and say, here's your HTML resource. Well, the cool thing about having the CDN in place is that it's going to hold that cache value for all of the users. And so once that CDN has it, then your origin server will never get talked to again for the 60 seconds while the CDN is hanging onto that cache. So even if you're getting hundreds of thousands of people requesting the same HTML page, they're not going to be talking to your origin server. The CDN will be talking to you and only once every 60 seconds. So that's cool. But what's even cooler is that, uh, the, or, or what the problem with that is, is once a browser says, hey, I want to get this resource, the CDN says, oh, I actually have this in my cache, but it's expired. So hold on there, browser. I'm going to go over to the server to go rebuild that page, and then the server will send it back. I can cache that updated page and then send it to the, the browser. Well, the user doesn't like waiting, and so what we can do is we can say, hey, C CDN, when you um, have this 60-second cached thing, I want you to hang on to it uh, for, for that 60 seconds, but if it's like another 30 seconds past that CDN or that uh, cached date, if it's stale by 60 seconds or 30 more seconds, then that's fine. Go ahead and send them the old thing and then update the cache. Go talk to me again uh, to get into the CDN with the updated version. And so the only one ever doing any waiting is the CDN, and the uh, users always get a uh, fresh uh, or a version of your resource, even if it's uh, stale by a little bit. Um, so th this just makes it way, way faster for uh, users. They never experience a, uh, or have a slow experience with this type of uh, uh, model for caching. Um, and yeah, we can just update things in the background. Uh, okay, so then you can also force a fresh value. So uh, on my website, I can add a um, fresh query parameter, and when I'm logged in as the admin, um, it, uh, I will force a refresh of all of the cached values on that page. So if I um, upload a new podcast episode and I know that I've cached that API call with the podcast uh, service for like a week, I can say, no, I want that episode showing up right now, and so I can force a fresh if I want to. Um, and then finally, soft purge. This is something that only a few CDNs support, and it's awesome. And so um, the, the thing with this stale while revalidate is you could say, well, okay, this is gonna, I, I want you to cache this for like a week. And then if it's stale for, uh, like if somebody requests it after a week, but it's still within like two weeks, then go ahead and ser serve them the old value while you uh, update the cache value in the background. So what, was, what soft purge can do is it can say, hey, everything or, or all of these particular resources uh, is now considered expired and so, or, or stale. And so once a user requests it, then the CDN will be like, it's stale, but we have stale or revalidate, so that's fine. So I'll send them the old thing and I'll go update in the background. So this is just a way to, um, to avoid the rush of saying, okay, I, I need to delete my cache, like everything is, is old now, so let's just delete the cache. When you do that, now you're gonna get just a rush on your um, resources to generate uh, the updated version of the resources. So soft purge allows you to um, kind of ease into that a little bit. We'll talk a little bit more about that later too. 
OK, so let's talk about another caching problem. Find the bug here. So um, the bug is not the uh, async await. You can totally uh, cache async things. That's fine. Um, and there are a couple of missing uh, or missing pieces to this. But um, we're getting a video buffer from the file system. And, um, and then we just do regular cache stuff. So what is the bug here? Or, or what, what are some potential problems here? Yeah. Yes, actually, I hadn't actually thought about that. But yes, um, you, if, if somebody changes the file on, the, on disk, then yeah, you're going to get the old stuff. But that, that is a good point. That's not what I was actually thinking for. I feel like I'm fishing for ideas now. I'll tell you. What if uh, you don't have a lot of memory? Or what if you have a lot of memory, but your files are really big? You're going to run out of memory. That bug is right here in the size of your cache, that um, in-memory cache. That is not going to be good. So you're going to get ineffective mark compacts near, yeah, yada, yada, whatever. JavaScript, JavaScript heap out of memory. I got that from ChatGPT. I, I didn't want to take the time to figure out what the error message was. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, you'll run out of memory. So we've got cache size problems. So let's talk about a couple solutions to cache size problems. Uh, the first and easiest solution is to use a package like LRU cache, uh, which is the least recently used. So uh, I listened to a podcast about a year ago that talked about this as being the most efficient way to deal with the fact that you don't know what is going to be requested next right, uh, from your cache. So you've just got a cache of a bunch of different values. You're not sure which one of these is going to be um, used um, or um, most popular or most needed. And so like, you've got to get rid of old things if you don't want to run out of memory. You just don't know which things to get rid of. And so what you do is you just keep track of when they're requested and then ditch the ones that are uh, used least. Um, that works really well. I use this on my website. It's awesome. Uh, the file system, that wouldn't work for our example because we're literally talking to the file system. That's what we're caching. But um, file system is often a lot faster than talking to an API that takes 500 uh, second, milliseconds to come back. Um, and so you can just write stuff to disk. And that works pretty well as well. Um, and then you can get into databases. So uh, on my website, I cache everything in SQLite. And it's awesome. Uh, so, and my cache is even distributed because I use LightFS. And so uh, on the six regions or seven or eight regions that I deploy my website, um, I have a local cache that's sitting right there on disk in a SQLite database, which is a file which still blows my mind. It's awesome. Um, SQLite is the best. Uh, and then you can also uh, go up to Redis. I've used Redis before in the past. I actually migrated from Redis to SQLite, and I'm much happier now. But many, many people use Redis for um, caching things. But even in these cases, cache size is not just like not a problem. You still have problems with cache sizes, so you want to uh, keep an eye out for uh, your cache size just exploding. And LRU is a pretty uh, good uh, standard, for, or not really standard, but like a, a good idea for dealing with that problem. OK, so let's talk about really quickly cache warming. Um, so uh, getting the cache, uh, if you have an empty cache and, and warming it up so that no users have to uh, wait for the cache uh, to be ready is kind of an important thing. So uh, problems, you can get rate limited by API. So if uh, you've got, uh, you deploy your new site and there's no cache there, then uh, people are going to be talking to it a lot and you can get rate limited. So you got to think about that. Requires a lot of resources to do and makes users wait for fresh value. So you want to warm things before uh, this happens. Ah, everybody's chaotically requesting things all at once. Um, so. Soft purge is a really good way to deal with this problem, uh, to just say, hey, hang on to uh, the stuff. Feel free to send stale versions to people while we're uh, or regenerating uh, different parts of the cache. OK, so here's another uh, problem that you run into, cache entry value validation. So let's say that uh, you, you cache some value, like the video. Um, you cache that vi uh, video buffer. And then the underlying stuff changes. Or maybe uh, you're talking to a third-party API, and you cache their values because they rate limit you or throttle you or whatever. Uh, and then they change what's returned from the API. Now, what's in the cache is going to be different from what is uh, given in that API. And maybe you've updated your code to deal with the new stuff, but it's not dealing with the old cache, uh, cached version. So having cache validation, what comes out of the cache um, be validated, is important as well. 
Okay, and then request do, uh, cache request deduplication. So um, when you release uh, a new blog post or uh, like whatever new thing that you expect to be cached and you deploy that, if you've got hundreds of thousands of people requesting that all at once, then there's going to just be chaos and Arnold Schwarzenegger will be mad at you. Um, you don't want that. So uh, what you can do is you just say, hey, on the first person who's requesting this resource, for everybody else who's requesting it, instead of making that request again, we will just wait for that first request to come in and get cached and then send the cache version to everybody else. All of these are problems. Uh, oh, and it's kind of like data loader if you're familiar with uh, that technology. It's uh, pretty cool tech. Uh, so all of these problems are uh, challenges that you don't want to have to deal with, and so I recommend you use Cacheified. Um, I did not build, well, I sort of built Cacheified, but I am not the um, uh, project starter or maintainer of Cacheified. Um, I built Cacheified for my website and then invited somebody to open source it, which they did. Uh, and they did an awesome job and dealt with a bunch of problems that my <laughs> implementation had. Um, so it's fantastic. Uh, I think it runs in the browser, but it's intended uh, really for the server and it is uh, what's powering my web website. If you go to kentcdots.com and you're like, wow, that's pretty fast, um, then it, I should tell you all of the amazing things that it's doing on every request, and Cacheified is what's making all that stuff fast. So come talk to me about it later. My website is, actually last year I gave a talk about my website, um, and it is pretty sick. Uh, okay, so that is it for me except one more thing, and that is that you are awesome. Thanks so much.